whisper to one another. And I remember it vividly, like in your head, there, there, there are all these voices in your head, and one voice is saying, well, it's not my culture, but it's theirs. You know? And it's, it's okay to be respectful of that. It's fine. And the other hand, I'm saying you're just a cover. You're just, you know, just, you're just uh, selling that. This sort of torn voices. The way, the strategy we learn to cope with this choice, it's a very, you know, it's a very existential choice, uh, was as soon as, as, as the, uh, the, uh, the movie was ending, and just before the lights would come up, you'd hear this scuffle. <laughs> there was all the Catholics headed to the door. <laughs> to get out before you're caught in this trap. And I share that story because one of these survival mechanisms gets set in very quickly. And uh, the whole issue of being identified becomes profoundly important. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine at the University of Ulster did a study, uh, and a team of, of researchers, they found out there were 16 cues that people use in Northern Ireland to figure out which community they belong to. It's in, the, same, the moment you meet someone, I mean, it's a natural phenomenon. You, when you meet, you're trying to tell where the other's from. But in, but in places like Northern Ireland, you know, places of conflict, it's, it's a whole, there's a whole other underbelly to that process we call telling. Because your life depends on it. You know, that's it. So one way you tell is, you know, my name. Yeah, if someone asks me my name, it's already a political act. <laughs> I'm already identified. Which school did you go to? Because schools are very segregated. We have only 4% of children who attend an integrated school. Uh, which newspaper do you read? My family read the Irish News, which was the Irish Catholic newspaper. Protestant read the Belfast Telegraph. Which doctor do you go to? <coughs> we went to Dr. Boyd. <coughs> never dream of going to Dr. Burns. Where do you shop? My mother would never shop in Moors because they were Protestant. <laughs> which football team do you support? <laughs> on and on and on, you know? So you immediately tell me where you belong. This came home to me very dramatically one evening. I started life as a high school teacher back in 1970, what we call the Troubles. Mm -hmm. I was teaching English literature and French. Crazy, just insane time, you know. One night, I'm driving late at night, I think it was a Friday night, in an area of Northern Ireland. Again, it's territorial, you're not sure. Some turf, it's obvious who, whose it is. You know, it's very clear you're in a Catholic turf. But some, not so clear. This night I'm driving along, and I wasn't, I wasn't sure where I was. In a part, an area of South Derry, which is normally very Republican Catholic, but I, I wasn't sure was I there or not. Driving along, and I suddenly I see ahead these red lights, flashing lights. And as I get closer, I realize that there are three figures with wearing balaclava helmets, you know, just the, just the split in the eyes. And, and, and I know they're carrying something, I can't quite see. Okay. I'm by myself. My first instinct is, who are they? Maybe I should just put my foot in the accelerator and you know, drive through. Then that at all, all sorts of other fears. What if I, what if I kill someone? That was unthinkable, so I drove up, and as I got there, they flagged me down, and I stopped. Rolled down the window, and there's a moment where they, one of these masked men says to me, uh, what's your name? <laughs> you know. I'm thinking, do I say I'm John Smith? Or what if it's, what if the Protestant part of those trees? You know? And they would just give me a license. Mm -hmm. so, it was off you know, give him a license, he just step out of the car. Mm -hmm. I guess step out of the car. And they search the car. And I'm standing on the side of the road, he gives the license back and says, drive on. Mm -hmm. Nothing else other than that is. Huh. And I, I, I leave there and I'm all, all sorts of, you can imagine all sorts of mixed emotions, you know. I think God, I should have just driven on through, you know. I was relieved, but also angry. 
And what I didn't notice was, as I'm driving away, I noticed there are 10 men lying along the ditch with 10 armor-like rifles. I'm sorry for that. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> <First> choice. <laughs> but again, it's like I share that story because if that's a sort of called the environment where, you know, the very simple fact of saying who you are is deep, uh, you know, resonance and and can, can connect to all sorts of fear and threat. Uh, when the, I started teaching, and one thing after another, two friends of a, two brothers of a friend of mine had been in elementary school with, were ambushed. One was killed, and the other was blinded. And we'd meet the one who was, you know, the, the blind brother in the pubs, because that's where we go, you know. Go to the pub to hang out, talk politics, to, that's where life happens in Ireland. And again, you know, this, this, what do you say? You know? What do you, what do you say? And um, a bomb went off in my hometown. It killed seven people. And it uh, mutilated about 30 others. One was the father of uh, one of my friends, a Protestant boy who was my friend in the street. I, I grew up in a street that had 18 families. Only three of them were Catholic. The other two families, the children were grown up, so the only Catholic children on that street were my brother and sister. And so my friends in the street were present. And one of these boys, his father was caught, and it was, it was a, a car bomb, and he happened to be a road sweeper who was close to, close to the car. He lost his arms and his legs. And they brought him home, basically, to die. So in this street I live in, it's a, it's a cul-de-sac, it's a you know, dead-end street. So every time I'm going back and forth to the school, I see this figure, he's just sitting in the window. You know, him, so at least twice a day, I have to confront this figure in the window. And then there's the whole thing, well, what if I meet his sons, the three sons? Because this was done from people from my community. You know? What do you say? What do you do? And it's not like the community has figured out how to deal with this. And the school systems, this you know, this leadership model that, that uh, we present here in the OSR program it makes a distinction between what we call technical problem solving, where te a technical problem is where an organization or a community has within its resources both the knowledge and the skills required to solve its problems. With another, with another type of problem, we, we say it's adaptive in the sense that the organization doesn't have the knowledge and skills, and, and we may not even know what the problem is to begin with. So there's tremendously conflicting points of view about how to fix it. That's an adapt we call an adaptive problem because it requires learning by those people who have the problem. So for example, in Northern Ireland, you know, if you go to if you go over to North Belfast, which is a completely Protestant area, and you say, what's the problem? They'll say, the problem is as Catholics have a, a pope, a cardinals, bishops, and priests. They can't think for themselves. You know, it's like they're just puppets. Not only that, they think violence is OK as a, a method of social change. That's the problem. Right? But then you go over to West Belfast, big Catholic area. You say, what's the problem? The problem is 1125. The British came here. And they're still here. That's the problem. So you have very competing definitions of the problem, you see. And this is part of, part of the challenge of leadership in the world of conflict resolution, is how do you engage different parties who have very, very different perspective on what uh, the problem is. From their point of view, what reality is, what truth is, how do you engage them in figuring out how, what's the real nature of the problem, how are we going to make progress? Seems to me that's the great challenge, in, in, you know, one of the great challenges in, in conflict resolution. Um, the school system 